chocolate 3D printer, flexible OLED displays, AI game characters, microplastic collectors and much more. This is MOSFET Weekly. Starting off this week, Coco Press have opened reservations for their new chocolate printer. The Coco Press Chocolate 3D printer allows users to print intricate edible designs with various chocolates, and they claim it can achieve more complex geometrics than regular chocolate manufacturing techniques. It can be used in a variety of ways, from creating completely custom three-dimensional designs to adding finishing touches to existing chocolates and more. The build volume is 140 by 150 by 150 millimeters, though they state that the amount of chocolate in the cartridge may be a bottleneck, and they are working on a way to reload the chocolate midprint for larger objects. They're aiming to ship this fall, and those interested can reserve the DIY printer kit for $100, paying the remainder before they are shipped. In similar news, Aleph Farms have launched the Aleph Cuts brand for its new cultivated meat steaks. The petit steaks are grown using bioprinting of non-modified cells from Angus cows and are slated to launch in Singapore and Israel later this year, pending regulatory approval. They say that no slaughter is involved in the production of the steaks and a single fertilised egg allows them to grow thousands of tonnes of cultivated meat. I'm curious to see what the nutritional value of these are compared to regular meats. Here are a couple lesser-known 3D printing processes Firstly, 3D Natives uploaded an informative video overview on Directed Energy Deposition, or DED. This is the metal printing technology that's making the rounds, most notably in aerospace companies for quickly manufacturing rockets. The three-minute vid covers all the basics of the technology and how it works, so check it out if you're curious. Another interesting one that I've not heard much about is Ultrasonic Additive Manufacturing, or UAM, and it's a way of 3D printing metal without melting it. Strips of metal are placed on the build surface layer by layer and is bonded together by ultrasonic welding. A CNC mill then shaves off the excess material around the object, revealing the final piece. Fabrisonic is a company which uses this technology and they announced the Sonic Layer 1600 UAM Hybrid 3D printer this week. It features a build volume of 368 by 368 by 432 millimeters and is their smallest printer to date. They hope through this that they can open this technology up to a wider market. In other news, Nano 3D Print unveiled their D4200S printer. The company claims that it is the highest resolution print system in additive manufacturing today, capable of printing between 20 nanometers to 250 micrometers, achieving ultimate printing positional accuracy at less than one nanometer. With the ability to print functional materials for electronics, prototyping, R&D, industrial applications and bioprinting, the D4200S's print heads accommodate various print materials, including gold, silver, copper, polymers, metallic oxides, organic compounds and photosensitive polymers. The printer costs a whopping quarter of a million dollars and shipments will begin later this year. And rounding out this category, Clothing brand Pangaea has partnered with Zellerfeld to create the absolute 3D printed shoe. The new sneakers are made on demand like Zellerfeld's other collection we covered a few months ago and they aim to be 100% recyclable so old pairs can be returned and turned into new shoes. Would you wear these? For $250 I hope they are super comfy. I saw this recently and thought it was interesting. The Exit Suit is a full-body harness-like system with haptic and force feedback built in, designed to make VR experiences more immersive. It's currently in the working prototype stage, and recently the team opened a golden ticket system where people can get involved in development by building and testing their own Exit Suit. Those interested can apply on their website. It's certainly a curious design, and it seems to have more movement functionality compared to VR treadmills. They claim the design will eventually be open source, so we shall see how it develops. We've all seen phones used as VR headsets, though the trend has died down a bit over recent years. HoloKit X is a device with a slightly different approach, as it takes an iPhone and turns it into an augmented reality headset. What's interesting about this to me is how it leverages the iPhone's inherent features like LiDAR and the company's AR kit platform, giving users 3D environmental perception, 6 degrees of freedom, hand tracking, spatial audio and more. Users can even combine it with the Apple Watch for hands-free motion control. With Apple's official headset rumoured to be coming out soon, I wonder how this will survive. 
though at only $129 it may still find a niche for those who don't want to fork out for a separate system. In other news, a recently released video shows a collaboration between Verizon and Trigger XR and their vision for how American football training could look when using augmented reality. They created a three-dimensional experience for coaches and players built with Snapdragon spaces. The system takes any flat surface and transforms it into an interactive field which allows users to view and test out game strategies, and they even have a feature allowing them to view everything in first person. Researchers at the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago have designed a material which can bend in half or stretch to more than twice its original length while still emitting a fluorescent pattern. An important aspect of their design was the use of thermally activated delayed fluorescence, which converts electrical energy into light in a highly efficient way, and they claim it can provide performance on par with commercial OLED technologies. Though it's in the very early stages, this method of constructing flexible, stretchy OLEDs is another step towards new possibilities for things like wearable technologies, folding displays and more. A team at Google and Stanford created a simulated world and put 25 generative agents inside to see how they would interact with each other. The system used ChatGPT as its basis, and each character was given its own thousand character description of their personality and their relationships with the other agents. Over two simulated days, the characters began to interact with each other in interesting human-like ways, and in one example, one of them spontaneously decided to throw a Valentine's Day party, choosing its own location and time. The news spread throughout the town, and the party went ahead, though interestingly, not all the characters attended because they didn't feel like it. Links to the paper and the demo site are in the description. After announcing the Firefly generative AI models for their creative apps, Adobe recently shared how they are now bringing this technology to video and audio editing. To start with, the company is exploring how users can edit videos through text to change things like colour schemes, seasons, time of day, etc., Users will also be able to generate music and sound effects which fit the video scene they are in, and also motion graphics and effects for text, graphics and logos. These features will start being included in Adobe's video editing apps later this year. NVIDIA has also been exploring text-to-video generation using latent diffusion models, or LDMs. Researchers at the company recently released the paper, Align Your Latents, High Resolution Video Synthesis with Latent Diffusion Models explaining how they added a temporal or time element to text-to-image LDM stable diffusion to create high-res videos. Although most of this is way over my head, it appears that this technique for generating videos requires much less training data to still generate high-resolution, visually consistent outputs. Their site links to the paper and has a lot more detail and examples. Sticking with the subject of AI, a recent Sony World Photography Award was won by an AI-generated image. Boris Eldagson entered the competition as a way to push forward the debate on where AI-generated art fits in the photography world. He refused the award and the prize, and made a detailed post describing what happened. I applied as a cheeky monkey to find out if the competitions are prepared for AI images to enter. They are not. We, the photo world, need an open discussion. A discussion about what we want to consider photography and what not. Is the umbrella of photography large enough to invite AI images to enter? Or would this be a mistake? With my refusal of the award, I hope to speed up this debate. We saw the Farmwise Vulcan Autonomous Weeding System a few weeks ago, while competitor Carbon Robotics announced they recently secured $30 million in funding to continue expansion of their system, which takes a different approach. The laser weeder identifies weeds and targets them for elimination. The system's 30 high-powered CO2 lasers destroy the meristem of the weed with millimetre accuracy without damaging nearby crops or disturbing the soil. This year, the company aims to bring this system to farms in 17 states across the US and three provinces in Canada. And ending with a potentially positive breakthrough. Researchers from Shinshu University in Japan have been trying to tackle the problem of microplastics in water and have developed a microfluidic device which uses ultrasonic sound waves to focus the material for easy collection. Yoshitake Akiyama explains, 
This proposed microfluidic device based on acoustic focusing can efficiently, rapidly and continuously collect 10 to 200 micrometer microplastics without recirculation after prefiltration of larger microplastics through a mesh. It can be installed in washing machines, factories and other sources of microplastics for efficiently enriching and removing various size microplastics from laundry and industrial wastewater. This will make it possible to prevent the discharge of microplastics to the environment. Alright, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching and if you'd like to see more, subscribe to this channel or check out mosfet.net.